that some things are heaven and hell issue and there are other things that are just a revelation issue so even if we disagree it doesn't mean that oh you know you're a false prophet or you're going to hell peter and paul they disagreed on different things if you believe that jesus is god well now uh i'll back up here a second uh, peter and paul disagreed on different such as um i'd like like some specificities there i mean there's a lot of people that assert apostolic uh, inconsistency between Peter and Paul, uh, but I would like to know what specifics would be referred to there, and certainly they did not disagree on who God is, who we're worshiping, whether we're worshiping one person that acts like three persons, or whether we're worshiping one God has manifested himself in three persons. Um, that's, that is a heaven and hell issue in the sense that it defines not only the object of worship, uh, but the gospel is a Trinitarian gospel. It is grounded in the Father's decree. It is accomplished by the Son. Uh, it is applied by the Spirit. Uh, it can only be understood, for example, in regards to the intercessory work of the Son, if the Son is a distinct person from the Father. You can't intercede before yourself. Um, so uh, these are extremely important issues and cannot be put into just an area, well, Peter and Paul disagreed with each other, so we can disagree too. Um, I'd like to know what you think they disagreed about, A, and uh, B, uh, you know, you know, I mean, I mean, unless, are, are you talking about Galatians? Because Peter agreed with that. Peter agreed with the, with the rebuke, uh, and, and Paul was the one who was right. And it was a gospel issue, because <laughs> so that's, that's why I didn't figure you were talking about that. You, you can't be, the, the Galatians thing is in Scripture, so that's not even, uh, Peter was in, in hypocrisy. He, he was... He was not orthopodeoing. He was not walking straight in accordance with the truth of the gospel, as Galatians tells us. So that it can't be that. So it must be something else that is in reference there. If you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh and you're born of the water and the spirit, according to John 3, I feel like how Jesus said, uh, they're, they're not against us, they're for us. All right. So I. Well, uh, Mormons would, would believe all these things too, but. Mormons are polytheists, and they believe in multiple gods, and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that, but they believe Jesus is a god, and you know, there's all sorts of variations you can throw in there. You, you, you can minimalize things all you want, but the, the fact of the matter is, if you, uh, it, if you are teaching that the Son, as a divine person, has not eternally existed, then that's, that's a... That's a division issue. That's that, that has to be a division issue. I want to say to you, brothers, if you you know you choose to answer these questions, I generally have a a, a desire. You know, I, I I love truth. I love studying the Word of God, and I would love these these questions have been answered for. Well, in many instances, since the uh, since the third and fourth centuries, um, and in Marcus's own life, he has been responded to repeatedly uh, by numerous people that I know of that have given clear full cogent responses I have the unity in the body of christ i don't hate anyone i know when i was younger i was a little bit zealous and i've uh, apologized for that i say hey let's come together let's study let's seek god the bible says great is the mystery of godliness so i'm going to ask a couple of questions and the reason why i wanted to do it this way is because i believe that when you know people debate oftentimes what we see happening is if they if someone can't answer one of my questions they avoid it and they dance around it and we never they say well what about this and what about this verse no i want the answers to the questions and i want to see it in, in the bible so i love you brothers well uh, of course the, the other possibility is that you don't want to have to answer the responding questions <laughs> uh because your your system is is incoherent it is inconsistent with itself it can't answer Numerous questions. I do not believe any um, exemplification of oneness theology uh, can address John chapter 17 in any meaningful fashion. Um, there's just there's there's too much there. Uh, there are too many clear distinctions between the Father and the Son. The Son is clearly identified as as a divine person. There is communication between two persons, both in his prayer as well as in reference to uh, his preexistence. Uh, in the presence of the Father before the world was, where he was glorious, not just as an idea, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, maybe that has something to do with it, too. Um, I know some people call him, you know, hey, false prophet, he's a heretic, he believes in another Jesus, and, and things like that. Um, I don't have that energy towards you, brothers. It's all um, love. I believe, like I said, I believe there's certain things that if um, you believe it, you know, we can walk together, because some things are heaven and hell issue, some things are revelation issue. So, my first question... Well, any issue that is a heaven and hell issue had better be a revelation issue, too. 
the Bible says that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. And I, I want to say this. I already have, I'm not asking these questions like I don't know the answer. I already have explanations and answers for everything. But I want people to... Explanations, answer for everything. So I'm going to ask you these questions, but I'm... My concern is, um, uh, you even get to listen to the answers, uh, listen to the responses. Uh, you've already got the answers for everything. Study the Bibles for themselves. Study the Word of God for themselves, and know and know that the Bible cannot contradict itself. So, um, if you're reading the Bible and you find a contradiction between verses, it's your interpretation. It's not the Bible. The Word of God does not contradict itself because God does not lie. All right. So check this out. The Bible says the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. Would that not make the Holy Spirit the Father of Jesus? No, for many, many reasons that should be, I think, self-evident and, and, and obvious. Uh, never does the Scriptures identify the Holy Spirit's activity as the means by which uh, the Father is to be identified. The Holy Spirit is distinguished from the Father. The Father and the Son send the Spirit. So there's a distinction that's made between them. The relationship of the Father and the Son is an eternal relationship. Uh, that's something that I believe your your theology denies. Uh, I don't think you believe that the Son existed as the Son uh, prior to the Incarnation. Um, and uh, never does the Scripture say that because of the virgin birth, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God because the virgin birth. He is not the Son of Joseph, uh, naturally, and because of the virgin birth. But the identity of the Father is never connected. It's not. It's not. It's not said that Jesus is his Father. Uh, that the Father is the Father of Jesus because the Father overshadowed Mary or anything else. The reason it's the Spirit that overshadows Mary is because that's just simply the mechanism by which God works in the world, and it was a supernatural uh, conception. Um, that's not what makes Jesus the Son of God. He has been the Son uh, for eternity. Uh, that's the relationship that he bears to the Father, and that is not a relationship that came into existence in time. Uh, I suppose if you're an adoptionist or something like that, I mean, I, the, the problem is with all the oneness folks, you can't even tell exactly where they're coming from. But if you are an adoptionist or something like that, maybe you have some other way of defining these things. I, I, I don't know, but just in answering the question, that's not what makes the Father the Father in the first place. Question number two, where in the Bible does it say pray to the Holy Spirit? I know that it says pray in the Holy Spirit, pray with the Holy Spirit, to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But where does it say, you know, pray to the Holy Spirit like it's a separate individual? I understand that some people say they pray to the Father, sometimes they pray to the Son, sometimes they pray to the Holy Spirit. Um, we see this, you know, I think in the uh, Catholic religion, they pray to Mary sometimes, and I believe some of the other apostles. Um, there is no explicit uh, command or example of prayer to the Spirit, because prayer is normally done by the power of the Spirit. However, uh, you do have not only references of prayer to the Father, but you also have references of prayer to the Son. Jesus said in John 14 uh, that after his resurrection, you would ask him anything in his name, and he would do it. This had to be done by prayer. The early church was known as those, in according to 1 Corinthians, who epikaleoed, they called upon the name of the Lord, specifically in reference to the Son at that particular point. So if you have prayer addressed to the Father and to the Son, uh, then I certainly think it is appropriate or... or uh, acceptable uh, to address prayer to the Holy Spirit, though the normal object of prayer is uh, is the Father, uh, and uh, also as well as the Son as well. But there is no—no no one's claimed that there is a command to pray to the Holy Spirit. Uh, you might be able to garner some um, possible foundation from that, some of the visions in Revelation as far as the heavenly um, situation is concerned, and the, the seven spirits— uh, which just simply means the the fullness of the spirit of God uh, possibility, but again, it's not it's not a it's not a command uh, in the first place. So where in the Bible does it say to pray to the Holy Spirit? Um, the uh, we see in the Trinitary doctrine doctrine it says they're co-equal, right? There are three uh, persons, personalities. Some people say persons, some people say personalities, but they're uh, now Trinitarians say persons. <laughs> equal, right? There, that's equal in their participation in the being of God. They are not identical to one another. There are things that distinguish them, uh, given Scripture, as we were talking earlier, about the opera ad intra, uh, and then there's the opera ad extra, the things that they do in regards to creation. And so the economic trinity is revealed to us. So the Father is clearly distinguished from the Son, the Son clearly distinguished from the Spirit. 
in a way that is much clearer to us than uh, in, before creation, because we are part of creation and our knowledge of what took place before creation began is rather limited. Um, but this idea of equality does not mean sameness. Uh, it does not mean the same offices. It does not seem mean uh, functioning in the same way. It was not this, the Spirit who became incarnate. It was not the Father who became incarnate. It was the Son who became incarnate. Uh, and so they take different uh, roles in the accomplishment of the one work of salvation, which is not focused upon mankind. It's focused upon God and a demonstration of His mercy, His grace, His love, His power, and His judgment. There, I, that's like a big strong point. They are all equal. They speak together in unity. Um, speak together in unity. What, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, it sounds like a like a straw man. They they certainly are not saying contradictory things. It doesn't mean that they're always saying the same things or doing the same things. Um, there is a perfect harmony between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Uh, but harmony is not sameness. Harmony is not sameness. And so that's a big thing that I've seen a lot of people say. Like they're they're three, but they're all equal. You know, in power and authority. So why does, in John 14, Jesus say, the Father is greater than me? Uh, it, it, it amazes me that, um, that anyone... Uh, I, I mean, I fully understand when I encounter someone who was raised within one is Pentecostalism and maybe um, has not had a lot of encounters with, with people from outside their own very small cadre of, of individuals, uh, I, I, could, I, could, I could get that. And when I encounter Jehovah's Witnesses who quote this and stuff, but it's very hard for me to understand how anyone um, could put themselves forward as any type of a teacher um, who is not already fully aware of what the responses, the, the not, and I don't mean internet responses. If, if, if what you know about Trinitarianism is derived from com boxes and YouTube, I'm sorry, I, I have a really hard time respecting that. Um, when, when I studied oneness Pentecostalism, I went to the best oneness Pentecostal writers and, and I bought their books and I read their materials and we've tried to set up some debates with some of the leading, uh, individuals, uh, not the, not the young guns that no one's ever heard of before, but the people who've actually published have some type of an influence in their, in their movement and would still like to do that in the future. But, uh, you, you go to the original sources and if Marcus Rogers would read almost any book, any meaningful work of scholarship, on the subject of the Trinity, all these questions would be answered for him very, very clearly. And uh, John chapter 14, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, Mormons, uh, Unitarians, Oneness Pentecostals, everybody, everybody quotes it, uh, but they almost never quote it in context. The Father's greater than I am. What's the context of that? What's, what's the rest of the verse talking about? What's the context of the verse? He, Jesus has just said that he's going back into the presence of the Father. And he says to the disciples, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because the Father is greater than I am. So there's a clear context. The Father didn't become incarnate. The Father is not being followed around by Pharisees that are trying to catch him at every word. Uh, the Father is not being uh, uh, surrounded uh, by sick people with every kind of disease trying to uh, surrounding the house that he's in. Uh, he's, he's, the father has not had dust fall down upon his head from people breaking through the roof to drop paralytics down toward him to be healed. Um, the son has entered into human experience. And so the father has not become incarnate. And so the father is in a greater position. He is on the throne of heaven, surrounded by the seraphim and the cherubim. Uh, he is not walking the dusty roads of Galilee. And so the son is going to return back. If you just read a few chapters on, Jesus himself will say in that high priestly prayer in John 17, 5, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you in your presence before the world was. He does not have that glory. He has laid that glory aside voluntarily to function as the Messiah, to function as the sacrifice for God's people. And so he is going to return back to that glorious position that was once his. And so this is not saying the Father is better than I am, uh, but in a debate, my, my response back would be, then who is the Son? 
Uh, because if you are saying uh, that that the Father is greater than the Son, do you believe that the Son has eternally existed? When did the Son come into existence? Is uh, is the Son going to be interceding for us? Um, uh, how is it that the Son is worshipped by all created things in Revelation chapter 5? So that's why debates are what debates are, uh, because uh, they don't always, but should at least, uh, place both sides in the position of having to answer as many questions as they themselves are asking. It doesn't always work out that way, but it, uh, it sometimes does, and that's very, very useful. All right, if they're all equal, why does Jesus say the Father is greater? Okay, there's, there's clear equivocation, clear error, category error on Mr. Rogers' part. Um, Mr. Rogers' part, that sounds weird. Um, <laughs> uh, all equal, that does not mean they're all the same. That that is a that it, anyone who can make that objection has not even the beginning of an understanding of what the doctrine of the Trinity is. So, if you deny it, but you don't even understand what it is, that that's not it's not a good thing. Uh, that that does not cause people to go. That's a meaningful objection. You're objecting to something you do not understand. We are not saying that the Father became incarnate. We are not saying. Uh, that the Spirit became incarnate. So if you say, well, they're all equal, then how can one be greater than the other? Because the Son voluntarily entered into human flesh to become the God-man. The Father did not, and the Spirit did not. It's not even an objection. When you raise objections that are not even an objection, that helps the other side. That It really does, when, when people understand what the, what the doctrine actually is. If they're all equal, this is a separate question. Why does not why doesn't Jesus know the day or the hour? Mark 13, 32, he says, only my father knows. So are they keeping information from him? Because like you don't have the right security clearance. So we know this, but you don't need to know this. Uh, of course, again, those who have listened to this program, we have addressed this subject as it's been raised by Muslims, by Mormons, by Jehovah's Witnesses, um, all for different purposes, which is which is interesting. Uh, but again, uh, at, at this point, I if it would be helpful at this point to have a specific confession of faith uh, to understand exactly how a uh, an advocate of some kind type of modalism would find this to be a meaningful objection. And and maybe I've misunderstood where he's coming from. I, it's it's been an, it's been a couple of years since uh, I even had heard of the gentleman, uh, and I know we've responded to his his stuff in the past. Uh, my understanding is that he's some sort of modalist, and so a a modalist would have to answer this question as well. And normally the modalist would do it by uh, dividing Jesus into multiple persons, to where the non-divine son doesn't know, but the other part of him, because he's, he's sort of schizophrenic, uh, so he has one side that praises the other side, uh, and one side knows stuff the other side doesn't, doesn't know. Um, my response is that just as Jesus laid aside the exercise of a number of his divine prerogatives, um, including the display of his glory, which was briefly changed on the Mount of Transfiguration when he was transfigured uh, before the disciples, and they saw his glory as, as he truly was, and yet when they come down from the, from the mountain, that glory is no longer displayed. So there had to be a veiling, a laying aside, a voluntary laying aside, to point out the Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 7 says that he made himself of no reputation. This is something Jesus did. And so the laying aside of certain aspects of divine knowledge, evidently, for what reasons I do not know, we're not told, was incompatible with Jesus' function as the Messiah, just as walking down the streets of Jerusalem, glowing with the Shekinah glory of God, would have precluded uh, his being able to fulfill the position and function of the Messiah uh, in the way that God intended for the Messiah to live and to die. Um, that would have fit how the Jews would have liked it, uh, but that's that's not what, what God's intention was. So uh, there is a, a veiling. Um, it is for the period of the Incarnation. I am quite certain that Jesus is well aware of the, of the day and the hour uh, today, uh, but at that point in time, it's interesting, though, uh, that even in those words in Mark 13 and Matthew as well, 
when Jesus says, uh, no one don't knows the day of the hour, in that same section, he identifies himself as the Son and separates himself both from men and angels. And so, again, that raises the question, what is Marcus Rogers' view of who Jesus is? Um, is he the God-man? And if so, who is the Son? Is the Son two persons? And how can the Son be ontologically above men and angels if he came into existence in Bethlehem? Again, these are questions that would need to have an answer uh, and would have to be answered in a, in a debate context. All right. If they always speak in, um, in unity, why did Jesus say, um, let this cup pass for me? And also when he was praying. Okay. Uh, uh, another straw man. Uh, if they always speak in unity, what does that mean? Uh, you, you, where does the doctrine of the Trinity say that they can only say the same words? when they're taking different functions. When, when Jesus says, let this cup pass from me, he is speaking as a sinless son of God prior to taking on the sins of man. So it, he, is, he is not fearing death. Uh, in fact, he's not fearing anything. It's the sinless one facing becoming a sin for us, which again, absolutely unique, never happened before, never happened again, completely... Uh, cosmos altering reality there. Um, but that has nothing to do with the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, Jesus as the God man faced the reality. He said, it is necessary that I go to Jerusalem it is necessary. I'd be betrayed and, 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 and be killed and, and rise again the third day. But in speaking of that tremendous, uh, self giving, it's not the death that's in view. It is that taking on the sin. And um, certainly the son would not go, hey, this is, this, this is going to be fun. <laughs> no, it was, and, and, you know, so people say, well, if, but if he knew what the outcome was, then why doesn't matter. You're still talking about the one who is going to be made sin for us. It, it's, it's hard for us to even begin to imagine what that actually would involve and what that would what that would mean, um, but that's what he's referring to there. It's again this very shallow straw manish. Um, well, if they're all equal, they all say the same thing. Blah 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 blah. It, it just it's a very very simplistic objection uh, to a doctrine that's much deeper than these objections uh, even give uh, give ear to. Why did he pray to the Father and not the Holy Spirit? Um, why did he pray that, that, that's like saying, why did he use these words and not a word in other words? He, he did. It's, it's not a, there's not a why, why should he, um, he, his, his regular, uh, practice is to pray to the father. He is being, uh, assisted and aided by the Holy spirit, but his prayer is to the father. He says, glorify me with the glory, which I had in your presence before the world was addressed to the father. Uh, why? It, this kind of this kind of objection it just it it has no substance it's just it's it's air moving but it's like why are you even asking that what what's the relevance of it what where in the doctrine of the trinity is there something that would demand that he prayed the holy spirit there's nothing so it's just like i'm going to throw some stuff out there and see what sticks um what what's the reasoning for it i we're not told did the Holy Spirit's opinion not matter? Because when he prayed, he said, let this. So first of all, was his will was not lined up with the Father and the Holy Spirit. You... No, of course it was. Of course it was. Of course it was. I mean, even it wasn't. He did it, didn't he? That doesn't mean that just because he knew it was going to happen, that he cannot express the reality of just the, the recoil. Can you imagine being eternally holy? And then having the sins of all of God's people placed upon you and treated and experienced the wrath of God in their place. I guess you can't because you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand the Trinitarian nature of the gospel in the first place. I don't even, I don't even understand in, again, if this is some type of oneness expression, I don't even understand how that works from your perspective. What was going on there? intercession, um, the prayers in Gethsemane. Was this, was this one part of Jesus praying to another part of Jesus or something? Um, 
I, I, I've often said that not only are the prayers of Jesus impossible for this, this perspective to understand, but the atonement itself doesn't make any sense. Uh, I mean, how is this, how is the wrath of the Father falling on the Father? I mean, it makes sense in a Trinitarian fashion, because you have the Son voluntarily taking the place of those who are united with Him, and so on and so forth. Uh, but you, how does that work within some type of oneness perspective? If that's what's being presented, I, I say they're all, you know, they speak as one, they're in unity, they share the same will, all that kind of stuff. So was he in rebellion to the Father and the Holy Spirit because his will at the time did not line up? He was saying, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to. And then not only that, in the prayer, he didn't even acknowledge the Holy Spirit. He only prayed to the Father. Okay, lots of straw men, lots of misunderstanding of who Jesus is, lots of misunderstanding of the Doctor Trinity, very, very shallow, um, uh, missing a point, but... Sadly, there are a lot of, you know, if you want to find a reason to not believe, it's not difficult to find a reason not to believe. Um, it, it, it's, you can, when, when I listen to many of my Muslim friends, uh, one of the things they like to do is they like to uh, isolate phrases from the Athanasian Creed, knowing that anyone who reads the Athanasian Creed without a context to it can just make it sound crazy. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy talk. Uh, when you read it in context, then it's addressing very important issues, and it's perfectly logical. Um, but uh, anybody who wants to come up with a way, I mean, you can do this with God's eternality, you can do this with God's creator, you can do this with God's goodness, his knowledge of future events. There's just anybody who wants to find a reason to not believe will be able to do so. Uh, and you cannot stop that. Uh, God will stop that someday. Um, the justice will be done. But there is no, uh, you know, people want the silver, you know, the quote-unquote silver bullet, the, the thing that this is the one, the one argument that'll shut anybody down. Nope, there is no such one argument. You guys say they all, you know, communicate together. Um, in Matthew 28, why does it say name instead of names? When the Bible said, when uh, Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's one name, a singular name, okay? Where in the Bible, different question, where in the Bible did... Okay, different question, going on to the standard Jesus-only uh, stuff. Um, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, uh, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, um, I've recommended, I, I would recommend for Marcus Rogers, but I'm not sure he'd bother to do it. But uh, I've recommended many times the excellent work of um, Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield on the subject of the Trinity, studies in the Trinity, uh, an excellent work. He does yeoman's work on Matthew chapter 28 and what it meant to be baptized into someone's name. Um, but uh, the idea here is not to go into a Hebrew understanding of name, uh, and how one divine name associates the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the same way uh, that not only do the New Testament writers uh, identify each of these divine persons as Yahweh, um, but that this, this unifies them in representing the one true God, but distinguishes them from one another, um, which is what the doctrine of the Trinity does. But the objection here um, is that what you should understand in Matthew 28 um, is that instead of taking this as a formula, which is what Christians have done down through the centuries, what you should have understood from their perspective is that when you come to the book of Acts, they're baptized in the name of Jesus. And of course, our perspective is that is the formula, and what you have in Acts is just simply shorthand for Christian baptism. In other words, the what you have in Acts is not the specific words that says, I baptize you in Jesus's name, which is the one name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, which really wouldn't, even in one of theology, isn't the one name. Because Jesus wasn't the Spirit at the time he was incarnate, was he? Was the name, was God's name Jesus before the incarnation? None of that makes any sense. But the argument is, well, you're, you're baptized in Jesus' name only, even though the person who's identified as Jesus was the Father in the Old Testament, was the Father and the Son during the ministry of Jesus, and is now the Spirit. 
and I don't know where the, I don't know where the where the sun went in in their theology in this particular man's theology. I don't know what ends up happening to him. Where in the Bible, different question, where in the Bible did anybody get baptized Father, Son, Holy Spirit? The answer is not Matthew 28. That was Jesus telling them how to uh, baptize and nobody was baptized in Matthew 28. So from that point on, every time somebody was baptized, they baptized them in the name of Jesus. So the assertion being that in the book of Acts, when they receive Christian baptism, baptism name, name Jesus, that's, actual, that's an actual quote. So you have the actual quote from Jesus, baptized this way, but that's not really meant to be taken literally. And then you get the general statements, they're baptized Christian baptism in the name of Jesus. Oh, but that's a direct quote. So the direct quote becomes a non-quote, and the non-quotes become the quote. See how that works? It's, that, that's how it works. So when he says, let us ba uh, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the apostles went and baptized in the name of Jesus. Nobody got baptized Father, Son, Holy Spirit anywhere in the Bible. Actually, Some people have argued time. with me. They said, well, the apostles did it wrong. Like I said, the Bible can't contradict, it, contradict itself. Um, who was speaking to Abraham and Jonah when the Bible says the word of the Lord came to them, right? When, when the word of the Lord came to Abraham and Jonah, um, Saul on the Damascus road, uh, when the, uh, Moses was talking to the burning bush, I know the angel was there, but then the voice said, I am what I am. What was that voice? All right. Do you believe that um, it was one voice? Just like there was one name, there was one voice. It says the word of the Lord. Who is the Lord? Uh, well, uh, actually, as uh, Genesis 18 and 19 shows us, you have Yahweh uh, in human form walking with two angels by Abr with Abram by the oak of Mamre. The two angels go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and then the Yahweh who walked with Abram rains fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven. So the Yahweh on earth rains fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh in heaven. And so that's why we have to let all the Bible speak. So John 1.18 tells us that no one has seen God any time. Well, who was seen by Abraham? Who was seen by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6? Um, according to John 1.18, no one has seen God any time. The unique God, the monogamous Theos, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. This is the one who became flesh, the Logos, in John 1.1, 1, 1, who had eternally existed in the presence of God in John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, and so this is a refutation of any type of oneness, Jesus-only type teaching, because John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that the Word, the Logos, is eternal. And that Word is not merely an idea. That Word is not merely a plan. That Word was in fellowship with the Father. That's what John 1.1 1, 1 teaches. That Word becomes flesh in John 1.14, is described as a monogamous theos in John 1.18. That's pretty much the end of oneness theology, uh, as far as that's concerned. I, he, uh, I, uh, what was it? Saul looked up and, and it was the Lord speaking to him. In all these occasions, the Lord was speaking. Who is the Lord? Is the Lord, as you guys say, the voice of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Actually, uh, Scripture identifies Lord, of course, kurios in the Old Testament is the Hebrew term Yahweh. Well, not always. Uh, but in many of those instances, it is specific the term Yahweh used thousands of times in the Old Testament. And the Father is identified as Yahweh uh, in, for example, Isaiah 53. Uh, it's Yahweh that lays our sins upon the Messiah. The Son is identified as Yahweh in John 12, 41, uh, Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, uh, 1 Peter 3, 15, um, uh, a number of places such as that. Uh, and the Spirit is the Spirit of Yahweh and hence speaks uh, for Yahweh. Um, and so one God, three divine persons. Hmm, sounds like the doctrine of the Trinity. That's why Christians believe it. The Spirit speaking as one in that one voice, or was it? the Father speaking. Some people say, oh, it was the Holy Spirit speaking through the burning bush, or it was the Son speaking, or the Father speaking. Uh, we are generally not told. Uh, we're generally not told. Uh, I mean, uh, there is the, the general statement that it's the Spirit speaking in the prophets. Um, David spoke by the Holy Spirit, so the one that, that engages in the act of inspiration. Um, but you, there, is, there is nothing in Scripture that says every single time in the Old Testament God speaks, we're going to identify what divine person is, because the doctrine of the Trinity is primarily revealed in the, out, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So it's primarily a New Testament revelation. Um, let's see. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? I, ha I was talking to a, a Trinitarian um, brother, and he said, well, it means, you know, t uh, fingers and toes and things. And so I asked him, I said... Again, uh, it would really help, Mr. Rogers, if you would uh, stop getting your knowledge of Trinitarian theology from people on the Internet, uh, and you would pick up some books um, and actually actually read them. 
and seek to understand them and understand them accurately. Um, the Imago Dei uh, is not fingers and toes and, and things like that. And I don't, I, I honestly can't even begin to conceive of why any Trinitarian would think along those lines. Um, it, it, there's no connection in any way. Um, you know, maybe you think Mormons are Trinitarians. Or I, I don't know. Uh, but the uh, the image of God is what separates us from the rest of the created order in our ability to have relationship with God, uh, to recognize ourselves as the creatures of God, to give thanks to God, to enter into fellowship with Him, uh, and to make us the objects of His redemptive work. Uh, so it is our ability to communicate with God, to worship God, um, and to see it, recognize ourselves as distinct from the rest of creation, our duties before God, uh, ability to have fellowship with Him and with one another in the worship of God as well. Uh, well, why did in John 1 he says God wrapped Himself in flesh, you know, and um, the Bible says that God. That's an interesting translation, but. It's a spirit, right? So if we're made in the image of God and God isn't sitting up there looking like this because he's a spirit, what does that mean? And if we look at how we're actually made, I have a soul, I have a spirit, and I have a fleshly body, but I am one person. Well, uh, if you if you take a tripartite view of mankind, um, I, I do not. Uh, I, I take a bi bipartite uh, view. Um, but again, we are created as one creation, which is why the separation of the spiritual from the physical uh, has to be dealt with. That's what the resurrection is about. It is unnatural for mankind to exist only in the spiritual realm. That's why there will be a resurrection body, and resurrection is the raising of that which uh, died, coming to life uh, again. It's the very meaning of uh, resurrection itself. My soul is not over here. My spirit is not over here. I'm made in the image of God, and all three are one. And when I die, my soul can leave my body the same way that the Holy Spirit can uh, come out from God, right? And we be filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit can come out from God. I, I, I have no idea what any of that means, uh, but we're not given any Bible verses that are even slightly relevant, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. What spirit moved across the earth in Genesis in the beginning when the Spirit of, of God moved? So the Bible says that... You just answered your own question. The Spirit of God? God is a spirit, right? And the Spirit is moving across the earth. Moving across the water. So you're confusing the category that God is spirit. He exists spiritually rather than physically with the identification of the third person, the spirit of God. Is that is that all this is? Is just simply a simple category error? Does that mean that if God is a spirit and there's the Holy Spirit, when you get to heaven, is there going to be the spirit of God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Are there two spirits? Is it one spirit? Was the Holy Spirit moving across the earth? Um, not really sure where, where this is going, uh, but um, there is the category of being spirit rather than flesh, being uh, material, spiritual rather than material. God is spirit, which means he's not limited to the material realm. And then we have the spirit of God who is distinguished from the Father. The Father and the Son send the spirit to indwell God's people. And it was the Spirit who was the primary instrument of uh, revelation to the prophets and apostles. That's what, again, I quoted earlier, Jesus said, David, by the Holy Spirit, said, well, yeah. Um, and so there you have some indication of the Spirit's role in, in that context. Uh, but it does seem that for a lot of oneness folks, there's a real struggle with, with categories, uh, being able to distinguish between ontological existence categories uh, and function categories. Those are those are distinctions that we have to make every day in life, but when it comes to um, reading the scriptures with an eye to recognizing these things, uh, some people struggle in that area. All right, that's just a, another question. Then here's a couple bonus questions if you guys you know feel like you just really want to answer these. A lot of your beliefs, very similar to Catholics, right? So Catholics believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they baptize Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You guys have a lot of similarities. Do you believe that Catholics are saved? Well, we've never addressed that. Here's, uh, let's not worry about the books back here on that particular subject. Um, I, I'm sorry, but, but it, it just does not strike me that, that Mr. Rogers really wants answers to these questions. They're, they're, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna present objections, then just be upfront. These are objections. These are what I, why I don't believe what you believe. 
but you know, it seems like you're very similar. Uh, no, um, uh, that is that is a a way of thought that certain people have. Uh, obviously, I could draw parallels. Okay, you're very similar to Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Mormons. That means you're a cultist, right? Are you going to accept that as a particular argument? Uh, are you going to accept the the, the, the you can say? But there's so many differences that are yeah that are categorically different. I get it, but then you need to get it too. <laughs> you need to be consistent. Um, Anyway, uh, just just very very briefly, uh, Roman Catholicism has a false gospel. Um, it has a a gospel that is focused upon um, an unfinished work of Christ. There is no finished work. Uh, the Mass is a propitiatory, unbloody sacrifice that perfects no one. The sacramental system is a system based upon the autonomous acts of man, uh, aided by prevenient grace. None of none of those things are biblical teachings. Um, without a finished work to be applied in the first place. And so it can never perfect anyone. It can never give anyone peace before God. And this is why Roman Catholicism must be evangelized. How's that? Do you believe that because they agree with the revelation that you have about the Father and Son, and Holy Spirit, that they believe in the true God? And my final question, uh, bonus question, is, is it, a, is it a heaven or a hell issue and why is it? Now, I know when I talked to Stephen, he said the reason why it's a heaven or hell issue and why, you know, these oneness preachers are going to hell is because they deny the Father. That was the verse that he gave me. And I said, we don't deny the Father, right? He kept using that verse. I assume that what you're referring to is in 1 John 2. Um, that is, if you do not confess the Son, you do not have the Father also. And so, again, um, who is the Son? From the objections that have been raised in this... Uh, in this video, the only way I can consistently understand them, and, and you may not be consistent, that, that may might be something you find to be relevant, but uh, if you're consistent, then you would have to believe that the Son is a creature who came into existence in Bethlehem, was indwelt by God the Father, uh, died and rose again. What that creature was, um, was that it was it truly a man? So was there a man Jesus? who was not divine, and then a man Jesus who was. So the prayers of Jesus are one half of Jesus praying the other half of Jesus. What happened to the soul of the man Jesus? Did he have a soul? Was he spiritual? Or was he just a, a, a carton, a, a box carrying God around? Um, where is the Son today? What's the Son's role today? Scripture says the Son intercedes for us. That's a, that's a divine function. Um... Scripture says the, the Son is being worshipped by all the creation today. But if he's just a creature, he shouldn't be being worshipped by anyone. So, um, there's, I, I don't know what your, your particular conclusion to all those things uh, might be. Um, but what John was saying is, is you, you are to honor the Son, even as you honor the Father. You are... And if you deny the Son, then you don't have the Father either. Now, the initial application of that was in the first century in regards to um, probably the early Gnostic heretics uh, or Gnostics who were had Jewish tendencies, some possibility of that in Colossians. Um, but the point is that uh, within Oneness Pentecostalism, because you do not confess the eternal nature of the second person, the Son, then you don't have the Father either, because you're denying the Father's testimony to the Son in that way. I'm assuming that. I, I did not see the conversation between Stephen Bankertz and, and, uh, and Marcus Rogers uh, to comment upon it, um, but that would be my guess, is what's being referred to. I said we just, you know, um, what we believe is you have the Spirit of God, and out of that spirit, you see different ways that God has cho chosen to reveal himself because the fullness of the Godhead, right, is in Jesus Christ. He is God in the flesh. Okay, so that's your standard uh, oneness, Pentecostalism, um, denial of the existence of three divine persons. Um, fullness of Godhead uh, does, does not mean that everything that is God was dwelling in Jesus in the sense of the Father and the Spirit, uh, as well as the Son. But the point, again, is who was the Son? Was the Son 
did the son exist prior to his birth in Bethlehem? That's always how you can identify one that's Pentecostalism. Um, you go to John 1, 1, the Logos existed as a divine person. Uh, you go to John 17, 5, the Logos as a divine person was glorious in the presence of the Father. Philippians chapter 2, uh, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, uh, did not give consideration to holding on to the equality he had with the Father, but made himself of no reputation by taking on the physical form. That's the Son that did that. Now, if the Son does not come into existence until his birth in Bethlehem, then all those verses are wrong. All those verses are in error. But if those verses are true, then Pente United Pentecostalism is false. Uh, and hence becomes a heaven and hell issue. It is certainly a fellowship issue. Uh, we, we worship a completely different God, um, and the gospel itself is deeply impacted by this because of what the very purposes of God are and the mechanism by which uh, redemption has, has taken place.